if I can have everyone's attention, please come in and find a seat. Well, I'm delighted to welcome, as ever, a really big audience, both in the room here and online, to this next in this um, Sussex Development Lecture Series on the Sustainable Development Goals. And it's been a fantastic series so far. And I think today we have a real treat in store in a lecture that focuses in centrally on the kind of problem, problematic we set ourselves in this series, to think about the challenges and the opportunities in really taking forward the SDGs towards that ambition that was set out when they were conceived several years ago. So I'm really pleased to introduce, although he doesn't need introductions to most people in this room, Professor Ian Schoons, who's one of our senior fellows, um, one of our key leaders on sustainability research. He co-directs the ESRC Step Centre, and I think you'll be hearing more about the Step Centre's work in this area this afternoon. He's also leading an important new project on pastoralism and resilience, and has been working in and leading conceptually and practically work in the field of sustainability and sustainable development for very many years. So, as usual, Ian will talk to us for around 45 minutes, then we'll open up to Q&A from you and also from our online audience. So, without further ado, Ian, over to you. Thank you very much, Melissa. <laughs> thank you for the introduction and thank you for all coming on a lovely afternoon here. And thanks for those of you, to you who are also joining online. So, as Melissa mentioned, in this talk I want to draw on some of the work of the ESRC Step Centre, which was established at Sussex in 2006 by myself, Melissa indeed, and Andy Sterling at SPRU. And it works across IDS, uh, SPRU and Global Studies, very much a Sussex affair as it's been over those years. And we've been focusing over that time on issues around the politics of sustainability. So, this is a theme we've been investigating with partners all around the world, and I'll mention some of that work as we go through the talk, and in particular, through the network of STEPS Global Sustainability Hubs, which are in Argentina, in China, in India, in Kenya, in Mexico, in Sweden, in the US, and in the UK. And we've been all learning together around these issues over this period. So, with the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, in 2015, it's not surprising that we were rather excited. The issue that we had been working on for so many years was now right up there at the top of the global agenda. So, I want to ask in this talk, can the SDGs offer us a new platform for the sort of radical transformations in society and economy that we'd been exploring in various sites around the world in order to achieve sustainable development. And I want to focus how we might think about that initially in the talk around food and agriculture, but then uh, build that out more broadly and ask what are the sort of politics that are necessary to achieve this, this aim. And I want to introduce you to, very briefly, to some of the concepts, frameworks, ways of thinking that we've been exploring together uh, that we could describe as sort of politically informed livelihoods and sustainability approaches that uh, have been central to this work over the years. So, the Sustainable Development Goals. As you know, were launched September 2015, huge amount of global fanfare, they were very different to the Millennium Development Goals that preceded them. The MDGs were, in many senses, rather geared instrumentally to a sort of aid agenda, very much a post-colonial aid agenda, and focusing only on the developing world. The SDGs were different. They were universal, they were for everyone, and at least rhetorically, they seemed to, uh, to, to promise a brave, inclusive, cross-sectoral challenge for all of humanity, focused on social justice and to use the, the language and terminology of the SDGs, leaving no one behind. But there have, of course, been challenges in this endeavour. There are 17 goals, as you can see on this slide, but there are also 169 targets, 232, I think, at last count, indicators, 
and 169 countries have signed up to this. This is no small undertaking. Now, unfortunately, in my view, uh, within the UN system and more broadly at the country level, a lot of the effort since 2015 has been taken up with data collection and reporting, um, rather than seeing the, the bigger picture of the goals as a whole. The rather siloed sectoral default has been very strong. And you see this in the national voluntary reviews, um, as well as in much of the discussion around the goals. The grip of narrow sectoral instrumental concerns has been very strong. So how have the goals fared in the period since 2015? Have they ended up with this lowest common denominator, bureaucratic, tick box uh, exercise that some feared? Or have they unleashed a rather more radical, universal vision for development that those supporters, including myself, have hoped for? So let's briefly think about the UK. The UK, as a country, has to present its voluntary national report to uh, the UN in July. The UK process around the SDGs is led, slightly unusually, I think, by the Department for International Development. Although it's supposed to be a cross-government effort and it's coordinated through the Cabinet Office. Now, on this slide, on the left-hand side, there is the, uh, there's a picture of the... Uh, the web page of the corporate position uh, updated uh, last year. And quite frankly, if you go and have a look at it, it's a rather desultory affair. It's lots and lots of different initiatives, goal by goal, department by department, just very little vision and imagination in there about what this is all about. There's a new document out earlier this month, which is a sort of consultation summary, which has a bit more substance in it, but it's still very goal-specific, listing lots of data, lots of activities, and again, missing, in my view, that wider vision. Now, I'm not against collecting data and having rigorous monitoring and evaluation. That's all necessary, but you need to do that in relation to something bigger. So, with a couple of months to go only before the report has to be submitted, there are a number of parliamentary reviews ongoing. And a couple of weeks ago, on the 15th of March, the International Development Committee undertook a cross-examination of the Secretary of State and the uh, Minister responsible. And they gave them quite a hard time. You can see it uh, online at Parliament TV, or dot TV. And it's very clear from these reviews, the Environment Audit Committee is also doing another review coming soon. It's very clear from these reviews that the UK hasn't given this SDG vision um, much priority. The data is very patchy, the consultations have been late and limited, and there's overall a lack of direction, I'd say, about how a more integrated, transformational approach might be applied. Now, I want to argue that the sort of responses that we see in the UK material, and mark my word, the UK is not alone in this by any manner of means, miss an important potential of the SDGs. But I also want to argue that all is not lost. There are plenty of experiences out there, and I want to share some from the Step Centre and beyond, that offer interesting ways forward, both analytically and practically, that can reinvent and revitalise the SDGs in time for the 2030 um, targets. This, however, requires, and I'll argue this throughout, a very different way of doing things and of conceptualizing what we mean by sustainable development. And this is challenging for all involved. So I want to go first to Zimbabwe. Uh, 
where I've worked uh, on rural and development and agriculture issues uh, since the 1980s. And I want to think about some of what some of the key elements might be if we were to think in a more integrative, political way about the interactions between sustainability and development and envision multiple futures and future pathways. So as many of you may know, uh, land reform happened in, in Zimbabwe in the year 2000 and it transferred around 10 million hectares of land to around 175,000 households. And that process opened actually many potential future rural futures, future pathways, highlighting in many ways uh, challenges across the SDGs. Now, I want to illustrate that with some examples from our research in rural Zimbabwe to illustrate how different visions of uh, rural development emerge. So first, there's a vision of smallholder agriculture, driving poverty reduction, increasing livelihood protection, um, based on low input, low pollution systems, but largely dependent on dry land farming and therefore vulnerable to climate change. It offers accumulation opportunities for some and basic livelihoods for many but yet it's set very often within a highly patriarchal setting. Second, there's another vision out there of medium-scale entrepreneurial commercial farming linked to markets, upgrading technically and economically, such as in this case, linking to local horticultural markets, selling to supermarkets, traders and so on, and earning income to pay labor and invest in the farm generating growth and employment in the local economy. And third, there's a vision of large-scale commercial estate agriculture, in this case, uh, sugar estates in the low felt, linked to industrial mills based on export markets with potentials for tax revenue generation, foreign exchange earning, and the rest, creating jobs uh, with employees supported by health and education facilities on the estates perhaps also linked to biofuel production and alternative energy systems. With downsides, of course, high water requirements for irrigation, long value chains, negative health effects for, more broadly from increased sugar production. So which one of these three, or which combinations of these three, make for, say, sustainable development? Well, actually, it's not very easy to say. In the descriptions of those three photographs that I've given, I've mentioned actually 14 of the 17 goals, if you were observing very carefully, um, but in very different contexts, very different underlying arguments around them. The bottom line is that it's not just a technical debate about the trade-offs between economics and environment and efficiency and so on. It's actually a political choice about the directions of development about justice, about recognition, about distribution, and a broader understanding of sustainability. Sustainability of what? For whom? So, how do we th can we think about these sort of things? Um, I want to introduce you incredibly briefly to the steps pathways approach. Um, so, in the steps pathways approach, which is a sort of conceptual model that we helps us think about, uh, about these sort of complex questions, we might say for any system, say food and agriculture in Zimbabwe after land reform, we're concerned with how what we would call plural framings of the world create diverse pictures of an underdetermined complex reality. And then pathways they emerge linked to narratives about these relationships. Pathways are co-constituted social, technical, environmental, economic processes of change in this understanding. There are dominant pathways pushed by powerful actors and interests, and there are alternative pathways promoted and practiced by those with, with less power. So if we're to think about what's sustainable, we have to think about different framings, how different people see the world. So in respect to Zimbabwe's farming, it's certainly a very complex rea reality. The system is highly complex, and there are diverse pictures and plural frames. And as we've seen, there are very different framings. And I mentioned three. 
poor people's rural livelihoods, local markets and economic development, export agriculture and foreign exchange earning. But there's an important politics of knowledge at play in all of this. And that's, I think, what the Pathways approach really emphasise. What is farming? Who are the actors? Who are the farmers? What's successful? And so on and so on. And with that politics of knowledge, there's also a politics of interests between different types of farmers, the state, donors, corporate ag agriculture, the media, etc., etc. So in order to understand sustainability, we have to understand different framings and their association with different narratives linked to interests and actor networks, which are what constitute those pathways. And so negotiation between pathways, say, for example, those three photos that I showed you before, are always, always political. Let me move to Kenya and think about this in relation to some other steps work, this time um, led by Hannington Odami, John Thompson uh, from IDS and Eric Millstone from SPRU, amongst many others. And as you'll probably know, Kenya is highly reliant on maize for food security. Different regions with different levels of food insecurity depending on highly variable rainfall. So depending on how you frame the problem, there are different responses. So some might say working with indigenous varieties can increase the resilience to drought and climate change. Others might say a focus on hybrids makes sense to boost yield, intensify production with irrigation and increase management. Still others might say that genetic engineering can enhance drought resistance and produce that ideal variety for changing environments. It depends though on how you understand the problem, the effects of climate change on cropping, the value of yield growth versus stability, the perspectives on risks of, uh, genet on genetic resources, dietary pre preferences, health impacts, I could go on. The work in Kenya developed a typology, if you like, of different pathways. We've talked about the range of maize-related pathways uh, just now. But there are also other pathways if we take a broader view of what the system is. If we're concerned with livelihoods, not just individual crops, then our scope necessarily expands. And we can ask a number of questions, which the team did. So which crops, for example, are best uh, with changing opportunities for our farm income? Le questions of labor, with changing gender roles on farm linked to male outmigration, are there other labour-saving options available? And despite the dominance of maize, are there other crops like small grains or mixes of other crops that might be more resilient and fit to changing market or dietary needs? So by expanding the scope and asking about livelihoods, we have different pathways emerging, all of which may contribute to sustainable development. And each pathway has different social, technical, economic, environmental implications, which we have to think about together. In other words, it's not about just about goal two, no hunger. It's about a whole bunch of other questions, ranging from labor to health to uh, broader questions of well-being. So how should we think about a more integrative approach to the SDGs, to get away from that sectoral goal-by-goal goal approach that I criticised in relation to the UK example. The Zimbabwe and Kenya examples suggest that we have to think holistically, systemically, across multiple competing framings and centre that on complex, diverse livelihoods. In other words, thinking across the goals. So, in thinking about this, we have to think about this in relation to how livelihoods interact with social and political choices. And this is at the core of what I would call a politically informed livelihoods approach that's uh, laid out in this little book here. 
In this book, I asked, can a sustainable livelihoods approach help us think about a more integrated and political way about these broader development challenges? It was written before the SDGs, but I think potentially those sort of arguments could be highly relevant to the SDGs. Now, it draws on this idea of a sustainable livelihoods approach. I don't know how many people in this room has ever heard of a sustainable livelihoods approach. Uh, there's a few, yeah, slight uh, generational bias there, I think. Um, yeah, but uh, there's no need to worry about not knowing about a sustainable livelihoods approach and no need to even worry about what's on this slide and the details of it. This uh, framework here was produced in the late 1990s at IDS around a project when we were working in Ethiopia, in Mali and in Bangladesh. And we were looking at the relationships between poverty and environment and livelihoods in, in, in different ways. Today, if we were asking for the money for this, that project, we would have framed it within the context of the SDGs. And it was very much about what does sustainable development mean across, across goals. So this, this framework was later taken up by many aid agencies and NGOs and others as a way of integrating and thinking about rural development programming in a more holistic, integrated way. That's a story that's told in the book, and I won't go into it. But it originated in a much longer-running discussion um, about the changing nature of rural livelihoods, uh, with many, many important contributions from IDS and uh, other partners. And the framework in this slide drew very much from a 1992 paper that uh, Robert Chambers and uh, Gordon Conway wrote, um, that uh, defined livelihoods as a, a livelihood comprises the capabilities, the assets, including both material and social resources, and activities for a means of living. A livelihood is sustainable when it can cope with and recover from stresses and shocks, maintain or enhance its capabilities and assets while not undermining the resource base. So that definition helped us think, okay, so how would you, how would you investigate that? Although we didn't know it at the time, I think we were thinking about the SDGs. In other words, we were linking across the SDGs, but starting from where people were at, how people understood the world, and how they constructed their livelihoods uh, in that sort of way. So when I wrote the book in that little book that I mentioned before in 2014-15, uh, it was about 17, 16, 17 years after that original framework, that, that one there, which was published again in an IDS paper in 1998. And I think by then there was a, there was a growing sense of the limitations of the, uh, the approach. It focused rather too much on the micro level. It didn't engage enough with historical structural processes of change, except as context. And it lacked, in a way, a concept. It was quite good for descriptive work, but it lacked a conceptual understanding of how change happens. In other words, it lacked an understanding of transformations. And what was missing, I think, was political economy. So what I did in the book was try to connect debates in political economy, agrarian political economy in particular, and those livelihoods debates that had been running almost in parallel. Um, and added some different questions, additional questions, to the original framework, which I think reinforced it. And I think, in a way, some of these questions are just as important for the SDGs because it asks questions about how things change, who gets what, who gets left behind, and so on. So, taken together, the sort of questions that were asked then and asked subsequently, I think can provide an excellent starting point for any analysis across the SDGs, linking livelihoods and political economy, and get us away from some of that 
uh, very narrow sectoral tick box approach that I was criticizing before. So has the debate on the SDGs learned from all these discussions? Because after all, these discussions have been going on for decades in this building and elsewhere. Um, I fear the answer, unfortunately, is no. The SDG process, indeed, has not even, it seems, learned from the UN's own experience. Now, if you're as old as me, you can remember the 1992 uh, Rio conference um, on, in, on environment and development. And at that conference, Agenda 21 was launched. Anyone remember that? Probably not. Few people. <laughs> Robert does. <laughs> Lewis, Lewis produced an A Agenda 21 plan. There we are. Before the 1990. Precisely. Lewis is always way ahead, as we know. <laughs> so, for those of you who, who weren't around in 1992 um, and, and weren't even in Lewis, um, the Agenda 21 was aimed at trying to locate the wider ambitions around climate, around biodiversity, around desertification that got um, presented in the conventions that followed in more local concerns. It was more grounded, it was more participatory, it was more bottom-up. There were successes and failures, of course, but in my view, bringing debates about SDG implementation to localities is really crucial. Sustainable development is about local negotiations, about competing pathways, competing frameworks, and diverse livelihoods in relation to these broader global ambitions. It's about negotiating across goals, around real live issues in, in particular places, and it must involve deliberation and disagreement amongst diverse people, and so generating practical solutions, and in the process, building the sort of awareness alliances and creating a new politics. And that indeed was, uh, to some extent, the ambition of Agenda 21. But it sort of disappeared, and it's disappeared from the memory of what we think about sustainable development. However, that said, I think there are a lot of other experiences out there which show the way forward. And I want to now mention a few examples from work of the STEP Centre under the Pathways Network that's been convened by Adrian Ely at SPRU and Annabel Marine at CENIT in Argentina, together with the other STEPS global hubs. And the pictures on this slide are what we have called trans uh, exercises in, in thinking about transformation in transformation labs in different sites. Clockwise in this picture in Mexico, in Kenya, in India, in Argentina, in the UK and in China. And the aim has been to bring local people, policymakers, businesses, researchers, and others together in a transdisciplinary dialogue about pathways to sustainability. Now, I don't have time to go into all of the cases, but each aim to develop solutions around a locally defined uh, sustainability challenge, whether that was around food and agriculture, or low carbon energy transitions, or water, resources and more. You can check out the website to see details of each of the cases. But the important thing about these were that they were deliberative, they were collective, they were participatory, they were political. They were about opening up pathways and thinking about what sustainable de development means in practice, in places. And it's been a really fascinating experience. I've observed it slightly from, from outside it. Um, but it shows the real potential for grounding the SDGs beyond that focus of the very high-level um, tick-box reporting that I critiqued before. So to give a particular example from the group, uh, from Steps America Latina group, who work with farmers in Argentina and identified together the issue of corporate control of seeds as a particular challenge to sustainable development. The limited choice available, the high expense, and particularly for poor farmers in a highly unequal setting. And the team in Argentina worked with farmers, with seed producers, with regulators, with policy makers to come up with a new practical transformative in innovation, in this case, an open source material transfer agreement for seeds. Quite a radical intervention, but quite specific. 
It transformed property and, and knowledge relations in really quite fundamental ways towards a more open and collaborative and sustainable economy for agriculture. It was in, uh, launched last year as BioLeft and a variety of different processes have com been combined in its evolution. There have been sort of more ins instrumental systemic shifts in, in policy and legal frameworks and contract arrangements. There's been, more, there's been mobilization by social movements uh, and farmers groups and indeed through media campaigns and others a, 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 a wider challenge to the monopolistic uh, corporate control of intellectual property. And as Annabel Marine, who's, who's pictured there, explained in a step seminar recently in this building, it's had some, quite some success, starting small, uh, linking processes uh, towards sustainability. So how do we understand transformations? These various experiences from around the world have, have pushed us to think, what do we mean by this word that a lot of people use, and indeed abuse, transformations. What does it really mean? And we tried to distinguish in a recent paper, some copies there actually, um, between three intersecting dimensions of what we mean by transformations. Transformations have to combine, as they did in the BioLeft case from Argentina, structural shifts, deep radical transformations and challenges to incumbent power. Let's not forget incumbent power whether that's fossil fuels or corporate agriculture or whatever, often is at the core of unsustainability. So we have to think about what is, 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 has to be confronted. But that has to be combined with more systemic, more instrumental um, shifts in policies, regulations, bureaucratic uh, um, procedures and so on. And all of that has to be galvanized and pushed for by what we call enabling change from the bottom up often unruly, often uncertain, and evolving through a variety of coalitions and alliances. Now, each of these three are political in their own way, and all are needed, uh, all in tandem. So, again, thinking about this experience, um, which we discuss in these two publications, um, and there are some copies, copies of both there, across the STEPS Pathways Network um, and the Transformation Lab approach that we've used to convene transdisciplinary dialogues and, and processes, there were some principles for transformation, transformatory uh, change that we have picked out. And again, there are three. The importance of diverse knowledges, expert, lay, formal, tacit, local, global, all given different weight, uh, given equal weight uh, in joint framings of problems and solutions. No particular hierarchies of expertise as, as you often find. And an acceptance through that of the importance of hybrid knowledge, combining different approaches and thinking. In other words, transdisciplinarity at the core of this. Now this, I have to say, then challenges some of the more conventional ways of thinking about the SDGs. The very narrow data-driven approach of the SDG implementation, uh, this just doesn't match. So it challenges that quite substantially. Second, the, the idea of plural pathways. I've mentioned this several times before, but an acceptance that there isn't a singular solution. There are multiple pathways to sustainability and they have to be negotiated and depend on who you are, where you live, and so on. And again, that again challenges the idea of, ex uh, of singular goals and solutions and the more bureaucratic and technocratic framing of much of the SDG uh, debate. And of course, I've said this about a hundred times already, but politics are central. Transformations require challenging incumbent power. In the terms of Mike Watts and Nancy Peluso, challenging regimes of truth regimes of rule and regimes of accumulation, all together. And so creating a new politics of mobilization. And this doesn't sit again very easily with the simple instrumentalism of much SDG discourse. 
So I'd argue that all of these principles and all of these approaches for thinking about transformation should be at the heart of thinking about and implementing the SDGs. So how do we think about a politics of transformation for the SDGs? What might it look like? Quite a big question that I'm not going to be able to answer in full. So to give it a bit of historical context, when the SDGs were launched in 2005, to be frank, the world looked a rather different place. It was more hopeful. It was more, it was, it was, there were more possibilities out there. The Paris Accord for Climate Change had demonstrated a huge shift in global positions on major environmental questions. And to give people credit, it was remarkable that the consensus around the SDGs and 17 goals came together at that time. A remarkable feat of internationalism, I would say. Today, sadly, is rather different, only a few years on. The rise of nationalist, authoritarian, nativist, right-wing, populist, we can call them what you like, movements and, uh, and politics around the world has seemingly rejected elements of this hopeful internationalism committed to social justice and progressive forms of sustainable development. So in new political contexts, we have to rethink. We can't just pretend that what we think as progressive, uh, nice things will, will happen. We have to think about how uh, politics changes in order to create new politics uh, that can uh, make a difference. So one of the things the Step Centre has been doing in the last uh, couple of years, together with a much wider network of others from right across the world, has been trying to track this change and think about its consequences, particularly in rural settings, but more broadly, to think about what is an emancipatory politics that might emerge as spaces close down for other options. What might this alternative look like that confronts authoritarian populisms of various sorts and provides a platform for realizing the more radical am ambitions of the SDGs? because we can't pretend this, this hasn't happened. So where do we get some inspiration from this? I want to highlight two books amongst many that I could choose that I found useful and have been published in the last year. First is uh, from Chantal Mouffe, who argues, um, and you'll probably f be familiar with her broader arguments, um, together with her late husband, Ernesto Laclau, she argues that the period since 2008 and the financial crash has seen the end of a global liberal consensus around what she would call a post-democratic, technocratic neoliberalism. Perhaps one might think some advocates of the SDGs think and wish that this still persists. But she argues, and I think correctly, that this change in polit politics, this, this populist moment, as she calls it, has opened up this space for the type of regressive nationalist uh, populism that uh, I've just mentioned. But she argues that this can be challenged through new alliances of the people rooted in social action and effective identities. She argues that creating a progressive left populism, drawing on emotional responses and radical democracy and the return of the political, as she puts it, can reconstruct the people, in inverted commas, as in opposition to oligarchic capital, um, exclusionary racism and environmental destruction. So she argues that it's an agonistic struggle between, in our terms, different pathways to sustainability. And she points to a variety of different experiments in Europe in particular, Podemos, um, early Syriza, Insoumise in France, and various others, where the emergence of what she might call a, a left populism has some uh, possibility. The other book 
I think, uh, complements this and asks, can such change really only arise from the bottom? What about the connections between movements and popular movements and political parties and, and structures of power in representative democracies? How do new political arrangements get forged, bringing diverse, tacit, practical, experiential knowledges from different examples of collaborative adventures in alternatives, new ways of living and doing, come together in a new politics? How can diverse knowledges be mobilized as transformative power? So these are the sort of questions that Hilary Wainwright um, in her book, which we actually discussed in this very room last year sometime, um, asks. And unlike Chantal Mouffe's book, I think offers some more practical, tangible examples of how transformations can happen. Now, these are just two examples, but I think the point of, of mentioning them is to suggest that actually in changing political context, we have to rethink and reimagine politics for transformation in new ways. I could add a whole series of other books, but you don't want to go into my whole library uh, on this slide. The challenge, though, is how to link these ideas about new forms of politics to practical ways of thinking and doing about, uh, in relation to development, in relation to the SDGs. Realizing transformations uh, to sustainability in practice. Now, these were some of the debates we had in a collective project um, uh, that resulted in this book a few years back that uh, I edited together with Melissa and with Pete Newell, who was speaking in this series um, a few weeks back. I think these various experiences um, suggest we have to th combine a variety of things that I've mentioned before in this talk. First, thinking about framing of pathways of development, thinking about diverse livelihoods and exploring what this means in, in respect of a new politics of emancipation. All of these things together, I think, point to a very, very different approach to development and sustainability. Now, this slide is an attempt to synthesize some of that, and it comes from my colleague uh, and co-director of the Step Center at Sprue, Andy Sterling, and I've adapted it from one of his. And he contrasts what he calls controlling transitions with caring transformations. So on the left-hand side, you can see lots of the frequently articulated critiques of mainstream development that I'm sure you've all been studying in your master's degrees at IDS. Coming from James Scott, coming from Tanya Lee, coming from Timothy Mitchell, and indeed from our own uh, Robert Chambers, amongst many others. But on the right, you can also see some of the concepts that have been expressed in the two books that I mentioned, and indeed many others, as well as the core arguments I've been trying to make about a, a politically informed approaches to sustainable livelihoods and pathways to sustainability. Presented starkly and dichotomously like this, we can see that these suggest very different ways of thinking about the SDGs and indeed about development more broadly. Sadly, the approach of the UK government and indeed much of the UN system and much of the reporting system that I've critiqued is firmly there in the left-hand side. The one exception, and we'll see how it emerges, is the newly launched uh, UNDP accelerator labs, which have been set up in 60 countries, which seek to do actually something more innovative about thinking across SDGs and have elements of, as it were, elements of the ideas in the right-hand side. But I fear, for a variety of reasons, reverse, reversion to managerial and technocratic type uh, may be in the offing. We will see. So are we inevitably stuck with this technocratic, instrumental version of controlling transitions 
of the sort that I've critiqued? Or should we give up on the aspirations for more caring transformations? I think not. And why? Well, I think there are a couple of examples and a, a few points of inspiration. These are some pictures taken on the level in Brighton a couple of weeks, a Fridays ago, where we see examples of new politics of transformation emerging in a more hopeful and a more caring uh, uh, approach, driven in this case by students uh, uh, and, and young people. My daughter was there, along with all her friends, and she wasn't alone. These are, this is a map of the places where these type of events have been happening over the last weeks. And on the level, it wasn't just climate. There were banners about biodiversity, about food, about lifestyle, about politics. I didn't, I must admit, say, find a banner saying, we support the SDGs. But in a way, people were talking about the SDGs without necessarily uh, naming check, name checking them and connecting across. And I think there are just a lot of examples out there where initiatives at a local level are emerging of the sorts that I described from the Pathways Network. So to conclude, I'd argue it's not too late to rescue the SDGs from what I would call a graveyard of technocratic and bureaucratic approaches, as illustrated sadly earlier by the UK government's approach. But again, as I said, they're not alone. But it does mean injecting more political dimensions into sustainable, sustainability debates. And in part, I think this means moving to localities and to connected issues that people care about and building alliances for change that link people in places to issues and institutions in new ways. It means mobilizing local practical knowledge and agency. It means linking people together through networks and movements, through struggle and contention, and confronting power, very fundamentally. And it means a politics of hope and aspiration that comes from below. It's going to be emergent, it's messy, it's unruly, but it creates new pathways and new opportunities. And drawing from Nancy Fraser, these must connect, I would argue, a politics of redistribution, and so issues of class and social difference, with the politics of recognition, and so questions of identity and identification, and a politics of representation, and so questions of community and belonging and citizenship. And this move, must move us away from a, a top-down approach of these grand challenges, what some poor people call cockpit visions of global control, and these simplistic modernizing notions of progress, even if couched in the nice language of the SDGs. I'd argue too that the analytical and practical tools such as sustainable livelihoods, such as pathways to sustainability approaches, can be useful in thinking in more integrative ways, but are not being so yet. But above all, as I've said repeatedly, this does mean a new style of politics, especially given, given the closing spaces we've seen and a different way of thinking and doing development. So I want to be optimistic to conclude, and if given the opportunity, I would argue the SDGs still provide a good platform for realizing transformations to sustainability. And while it's not too late, we've got till 2030, there's still a long way to go. So I'll end there. Ian, thank you. That was great and laid out a huge range of challenges for us, but also ended on an optimistic note with some really exciting examples. And I think a great compliment this, this talk to some of what we heard earlier, including a couple of weeks ago from Peter Newell, whose work was referred to. And I think there will also be connections with what we talk about next week when Joe Alcamo reflects from a very different perspective on synergies between the different goals. And it's been a little bit of a theme through this, this series. But um, let's open up now to questions and comments. Um, there are a whole range of things I can think of, but I've already had the opportunity to talk with Ian about many of these issues over, over the years. So 
Let's take a first round of, of questions or thoughts. So who'd like to start? So we've got one here. What is the relationship between SDGs and the right-based approach to development? And the right Sorry, could you say the uh, rights-based right approach? approach. Rights-based approach. Okay, great question. Um, so, yeah, there was another one just here. Yeah, lovely. Um, thank you. Um, you emphasized a lot on politics and the importance of political economy in development. And you criticized the sustainable development goals of not addressing that and not um, addressing the issue of transformation and transformative change and how do we attain all these goals through that. And I wanted to ask you, why do you think is that? I mean, is it just a simple naive mistake or maybe it's intended more or less? And what should we think of the STDs on that approach? Thank you. Okay, interesting. Okay, let's go to the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so there's the young woman in the black jumper just there. I can ask So, um, I'm an ex-student of ND Sterling, so we were exposed to a uh, controller and caring uh, concept. What I want to ask is that um, while we are promoting indigenous knowledges, they come with also culture and values. So, it reflects also uh, society's values and power relationships. So while we are promoting that, um, how we can actually just care or like not control if there is um, like power issues against, let's say, gender equality or, or I don't know, like religious hierarchy and that kind of things. So like how do we apply caring practices rather than control in this case? Okay. Or is it possible? It's an interesting one. Great. And so, would anyone else like to come in at this point? Yeah, well, Kathy, how about you? So, Kathy Holloway. So. Great. Thank you very much for a great talk. I wonder if you could expand a little bit more on data collection. Uh, in the, I come from the area of health, and the WHO Director General made a very good statement some years ago what gets measured gets done. And if you don't measure it, it doesn't get done. And if we go to the Millennium Development Goals, for example, we have not been very good on measuring drug availability or anything on drug supply systems, so we still have no access. It's, it's the one Millennium Development Goal where there's been no progress. And there's still a target in the st Sustainable Development Goals on this. And I wonder if there's something about developing uh, better methods of uh, cross disciplinary data collection and synthesizing analysis with local people so that that could be actually used to generate change for action. Otherwise, if you don't know what's going on, you can't change it very easily. And that's what I found in my experience in health. And I wonder if you could say something about that. Perhaps we need new research methods for quick data collection and analysis and using it for change. Great. Well, that's an array to start with, Ian. So right. why don't you get some of those? Oh, very good questions. Thank yeah. you. Um, let me start with Cathy's first, first on, on data collection. So I wasn't criticising data collection per se, but I was criticising the way data collection has been done to date. Not necessarily geared to um, broader visions of what's needed. In a way, you answered the question yourself because I think, uh, I think there are and, and need to be more systematic, bottom-up systems for understanding how change happens, whether change is happening in relation to indicators that people set themselves. Now, I think sometimes the problem with these very global, global indicators is that they are just that. They just get disconnected from place and people. 
and therefore are just routinized in bureaucratic processes um, in order to fulfill reporting requirements rather than being linked to particular challenges in particular places about particular uh, issues that people care about. But I think you're absolutely right. Using uh, forms of data collection to, to raise issues, to hold people to account and so on is absolutely, is absolutely crucial. It doesn't have to be quantitative data either. I think there's a slight obsession with, with, with quantitative data in the reporting systems. And very often, aggregated uh, quantitative data becomes meaningless as, as it goes further up. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of the missing data around sustainable development are about stories of change. I mean, sort of narrative forms of data collection that can tell us about how change happens. And that relates to this, this other question about uh, the nature of knowledge and how knowledge is rooted in cultures and values. So we can't necessarily extract knowledge, uh, data from knowledge which is rooted in people's you know, deeper understanding of, uh, of particular places and, and, and particular contexts. Um, indigenous knowledges necessarily have to contribute to uh, the challenges of, of the sustainable development goals, but they can't just be abstracted out of context and used in an instrumental way. They have to be part and parcel of knowledge as power, as part of struggle, as part of transformative processes. So that's why I think you know, the difference between knowledge and data then becomes significant, and then data and knowledge and knowledge as embedded uh, understanding for change then becomes important. Um, it, uh, it's, let me comment first on the rights-based approach. I think the SDGs um, are very rooted in, in sort of rights-based thinking. Um, you know, the sort of basic questions of, of uh, leave no one behind is very much a sort of rights-framing type of, type of debate. Um, it's been interesting that the, the, the sort of rights language, despite it being associated with the UN, hasn't embedded itself particularly within, uh, within the SDGs. But I think a lot of the struggles around particular SDG areas uh, are translated within movements uh, around uh, rights framing. So when we're thinking about our trio of structural, systemic, and enabling change as, um, as constituting transformation, um, rights challenges uh, are relevant to all three and have to be. Um, there is, as you know, a critique of rights-based approaches then becoming very instrumental and sometimes rather legalistic. But if we take a, a broader understanding of of rights as, as uh, embedded in people's social and political struggles, then I think uh, there's no incompatibility there at all. It relates, relates to the question about politics, whether the absence of politics and a te technocratic um, approach is naivety or by intention. Um, I think it's a bit of both is the answer. Um, I think you know if you if you discuss with anyone involved in in in, in SDG debates, they would say, of course it's political, uh, but then the 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 process is sanitised in in the way that the bureaucratic structures um, uh, instrumentalise the way that uh, it's both thought about and and implemented. I think by emphasizing politics and political economy and the nature of transformation, it just raises the bar for, for all of us, governments, civil society and others, to say, let's not just make this a technical, um, a technical choice. Development isn't. Um, sustainable development certainly isn't. And as, uh, uh, as Pete mentioned in his talk on climate change, of course, struggles against, you know, struggles to transform um, societies to low carbon economies are going to be political. Yes, they're going to be technical policy things that you can do, but you've, also, you've got to confront incumbent power of the fossil fuel industry as well as thinking about technologies that can, 
um, develop uh, low-carbon solutions, as well as mobilising in order to hold governments to account in order that uh, these changes happen. And all of those are necessarily political choices, which is why um, a, a sanitised technocratic approach uh, around all of this is very dangerous. And it's, more da it's dangerous more broadly in development, but it's dangerous particularly around this moment of opportunity for the SDGs. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Ian, I'd like to throw in one. I was really interested in the context of thinking about the politics of sustainable development in your allusion to Agenda 21, our local Agenda 21 in the 1990s, and wondered if you could reflect a little bit more on how successful or what some of the lessons that we might learn from that process could be, particularly with respect to... The, I think the really important points you're making about the politics now, the movement politics for transformation, which are almost by definition fragmented because they're local, they're contextual, they're particular, they're around diverse issues in diverse places with diverse people. But yet, does that mean that they're not adding up to a, a cross-cutting SDG-related equivalent of Local Agenda 21? Do we need something that is cross-cutting, that brings these multiple movements together and speaks up from the bottom to the SDGs? Or are actually the local SDG processes that are already happening or the kind of more implicit adding up of things like the youth climate movement or the hugely diverse movements happening across the world enough? So if just, just that thing about yeah. how movements add up. Um, but that's just one question. Let's have some more from the floor or from our online audience if you're there. So let's come to this row, and we've got Shuli and the gentleman on the end here. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, another question regarding the politics and the political economy in particular. Um, and I was wondering, how far do we need to go with this? As in, do we need to challenge the actual kind of underlying power structures that governments in the global north tend to dominate, um, and also the institutions and the knowledge systems that we have in development. Yeah, really good point. So just along the road, we'll go to Shirley here. Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually teach uh, Introduction to Development Studies in China's university. And in the governance this chapter, I always teach us about the comparison between moving from a government to governance. So that uh, seems like from a controlling transition to caring transition. But it was uh, taught 1990s. So today, what's the new, you know, what's the new contact, as uh, Melissa mentioned? And, uh, and uh, particularly from the development experiences from those thousand countries, whether any new knowledge could be contributed to this process. And secondly, um, I noticed that you, you emphasized that to bring politics to livelihood framework. You know, but on the other side, for instance, in China sectors, um, they, they also take the SDG in their policy agendas, then emphasize so much about SDG. So it seems to them that, that they, they depolitics this process. So this, uh, uh, you know, politicized analysis, this contact, but also on the other side, depoliticize this process. So how, how would you, you know, perspect this? See this. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay. So I think we've got a question from our online audience as well. Two, in fact. And then we might take another from here as well. Yeah. Uh, the first one's from Burag Gurdon. How do you relate the Nexus approaches to resource governance to the sustainable development agenda and how do these two align? And from Sibabrata Chowdhury. Do you have any examples of government agencies tackling SDG transformations, or is this a dialogue confined to researchers? Okay. Right. We've got those ones. Good. So maybe one more. Is there anyone from this side of the room? Did I miss anyone? Yeah, let's come to the front here. Thank you. Maybe this question will be a little bit technical, but I'm just curious if during your practice in STEPS, uh, did you receive any feedback from UN agencies? And I just want to understand it, uh, this, uh, the answer of this question to see 
to what extent the research that is done have an impact on global development policy making processes, not only at national level, but also at the global level. To what extent this is taken into account for developing the new policies regarding the SDGs? Mm. Thanks. Okay. Great. Well, that's another, All right. <laughs> another batch. <laughs> yeah, that is six in Great my account. Questions. Yep. Very good questions all. Um, okay, I will uh, try and answer Melissa's one first because it relates to a few of the others. So the question was, was how do uh, localised experiences and multiple movements in different places add up? And did this happen in the 1990s as a consequence of Agenda 21? I think my argument for thinking about localities as places to experiment and provide new sources of innovation, both political, technical, social, and otherwise, is uh, the emphasis that that's where that sort of creativity and innovation happens. And I think we saw, we, we saw that through the Pathways Network um, examples that I mentioned in the talk, and we saw it back then in, um, in Agenda 21. When I first came to Brighton in 1994, I joined the local Agenda 21 group and we set up a recycling thing. The, the, the city council at that point had no recycling whatsoever. The person who was then the, you know, we had this, uh, it then became the magpie recycling thing and it grew to a whole variety of different things through the 1990s. So it was a very local, specific thing at the start, but over time, and you look back, well, I don't know how many years ago it is now, I can't even do my maths, but a long time ago, now the City Council does recycling throughout, every week. Now the person who actually led that process is my green councillor yeah. on the council, um, and so on and so forth. So small from small things other things grow and i think we shouldn't dismiss these small things because they they can connect over time mm. as new moments and new political connections and new things emerge the question you also ask is do you need, do we need something to connect them together yeah. to make that happen i think we do yeah. um, and i think that's what the sdg should be providing should be providing that platform to allow people to share and, and exchange ideas and experiences globally, much as we've been doing on a very small scale with the Pathways Network, and learn from each other's experiences. Yeah. Not necessarily spend a huge amount of time monitoring and everything of how much recycling happened X, Y, and Z, but actually learn about the processes that happen. Very often they're the things that then become crucial. So to, to develop the SDGs at an international level, not as a sort of elaborate um, uh, reporting system, but one that allows uh, learning and sharing to happen. So I think there are, you know, platforms of this sort are important, and a global platform mm -hmm. that's agreed at the United Nations level through that form of consensual internationalism is very, very powerful mm -hmm. and could provide that platform, but currently isn't. Um, Julie asked, uh, oh no, there was a the wider question which I can answer very quickly about how far do we have to go? Do we have to ca challenge power structures, institutions and knowledge systems? The answer is basically yes. Um, uh, absolutely, that has to be at the centre of it. Um, because confronting power and the patterns of unsustainability that exist today must involve overturning, as I said several times in the talk, incumbent power. I mean, what exists now has to change and so that has to sometimes be quite radical. Yes, we can have um, systemic instrumental change at the margins, but only when it's combined with that bigger structural change uh, will we see uh, longer term patterns of sustainability emerge. So we have to, to work at all levels in all ways and that's why um, that sort of global connection becomes important. So Julie's asked about how new emergent knowledges from the South can help us rethink the way we think about governance and sustainability. Absolutely. I think some of the most the interesting things that came out of that Pathways Network 
uh, approach from China, from Mexico, from Kenya, Argentina, and, and indeed the UK and so on, showed how uh, new forms of governance around water resources and uh, around uh, low carbon transitions are emerging through people's practice. And often that practice is coming from, from, from the South and also from the North. I mean, again, what was nice about that network, and it's a shame Adrian Ely's not here to, to talk about it, um, what was nice about that network um, was that it was both North and South. Sharing went on uh, between the UK, thinking about um, uh, new market linkages for food provision to Brighton from changing land use in and around the city of Brighton, as well as wetland um, conservation and so on in, in Mexico. So I think there were lots of very interesting governance um, uh, innovations that were going on there. And by governance rather than government, uh, that was the distinction you made, uh, this was very much emergent out of people's practices and local institutions. Government was there, but only part and parcel of a much wider network. I was asked online, how do these link with nexus approaches? Um, I think they do. I mean, nexus approaches um, was a, has been a, an important debate about environment and development, um, linking different sectors, water, energy, food, and so on, and encouraging people to think about those connections. But in a way, nexus approaches can be criticized in just the same way as I've criticized the SDGs. They can be very sectoral, they can be very instrumental, they can lose politics and so on. So in a way, the arguments that I've been making in respect to the SDGs could equally be applied to nexus approaches. But I think you know, the principle there of thinking across sectors and thinking in a more integrated manner uh, uh, still applies. Um, are there any examples of SDG implementation involving governments, or is it only in the realm of researchers? That was a nice online question. Um, yes, governments are engaged in the SDGs, some more, more than others. I have a feeling that the British government had sort of forgotten their obligations in the chaos that has been the British, government's, um, the British government for the last few years, um, and they're just scrambling to get a report out. Um, the cross-examination in Parliament last week of the Secretary of State and her minister, I mean, it was frankly embarrassing. Um, they gave her a very hard time, and quite rightly so. But um, I don't think that's the case everywhere. Um, I know we always point at IDS to our alumnus who is in Costa Rica, who is the president of Costa Rica, um, Carlos Alvarado, yes. Um, he wrote a very nice piece in the Financial Times last week on the Green New Deal in Costa Rica. And it was, there was one bit of that article, I can't remember it, the exact quote, which was quite striking. He said, the low carbon transition in Costa Rica cannot be incremental. It must be transformative. So there's a president of a country, fortunately educated at IDS in part, uh, making the case that the state has to take the lead in providing a framework for transformatory change. It cannot be incremental. And that was written in the Financial Times. It's, it's worth, worth having a look at that article from uh, literally only a week, a week or so ago. So states are involved and states are um, engaging in these issues. Around all the research that we've done, how, has, how have we engaged with the UN and other policy processes? Well, I think, again, going back to those examples of the Pathways Network embedded in each of those countries, there have been lots of interactions at national levels with policy, uh, policy makers in government, in business and, and elsewhere, in and around the issues that they've been, they've been looking at. More broadly, around the SDGs as a whole, um, Achim Steiner, who's now the, uh, the administrator of the UNDP, the head of the UNDP, and has a, an administrative um, responsibility for UN, for UN um, direction on, on the SDGs, was, uh, came and gave the STEPS annual lecture, I think a month or two before he took up his post, 
Um, and we've had some good discussions uh, uh, then and since in and around that. And it was through, through that connection that I learned about the UNDP's Accelerator Lab initiative. Um, so I think there are opportunities and there is a willingness to, to listen and to exchange and, um, and uh, I think people aren't naive to the challenges. I think just sometimes people, uh, bureaucratic systems, uh, and the UN is a very large bureaucratic system, uh, sometimes uh, sort of drop to the default of instrumentalism and don't necessarily think, okay, well, how can we create a more transformative, uh, transformative pathway? Great. Well, we've probably got time just for a couple more. So I know Richard wants to ask a question, and we'll go to you behind and maybe time for one more after that, and then we'll... Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is what needs to be done, in your view, top-down? You've made a very good case, widely, of the bottom-up, but what needs to be top-down? If I've got a moment or two, I'd say the UK example is about the worst I can imagine. It's, it's yeah. done politically for defensive purposes. If I asked, as I have, what's happening in Lewis or Bristol or otherwise, they'll tell you poverty is rising yeah. because of, well, I don't want to answer the first, my question, because of austerity <laughs> and a lot of other things. Yeah. I just slip in also, Bristol, for example, has created an SDG ambassador to go around the school and say, what are you doing? What is bad? Hey. Also, the ambassador is to sit in on all Bristol Council meetings, how or what you're discussing relating to the SDGs. So I think you'll find in Britain there is grassrootsy level much more, yeah. as I know and in lots of other countries. But yeah. don't quote the UK government, please. Okay. All right, so just behind, yep. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is about facilitating the change. Uh, having said that sustainable development is a contesting, contested process involving many uh, stakeholders with different perspectives, uh, what are the ways to help them develop their narratives, uh, develop alternative scenarios, understand trade-offs, and come to a decision eventually and take some action? Because it's a long process and uh, sustainability scientists say we don't have so much time. Yeah. So, uh, how to f facilitate that process on such a scale within short period of time? What are methodological ways? Uh, what is current state of research and practice? Okay, great question. question. So, just yeah. a little bit further back. Yeah, I think that's probably best to be the last. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is related to the structural changes in relation to society and politics. For instance, wh what's happening in, Brit in Britain is said to be manifestation of SDGs, people marching, but for a good cause to, ha to have that sustainable development uh, goals achieved. But when you take that to Global South, you find like the movement is either about identity, access to resources, mm. and there is a lot of social differentiation, classes. So like how will the, the left approach apply in this case? Because like we find the government is trying to establish a policy but how it is received, received at the grassroots level is completely different. It leads to more differentiation and uh, conflict. So how will, that, how will this apply in, in, the, in that case? Thank you. Okay. Well, I think that's really about all we've got time for. So, Ian, feel okay. free to come back on any of those and then any final remarks that you'd, you'd like to make. Okay. Um. So first to Richards, um, what, happens, what has to happen at the top in order to allow all of these yeah. exciting things from the bottom to, to be realised? Well, it does need vision and leadership. I mean, that's, that's the start, which has been, as I said, horribly absent in the UK context, which doesn't mean to say there's not a lot of happening. There is. Um, while I picked out the UK, I wouldn't say that the UK is alone in having a very instrumental, slightly sort of humdrum, lack of vision approach to the SDGs at the central level. 
So what has to happen? What has to happen in order to galvanize, to motivate, to network, to create new alliances between all of the things that are actually already going on? Um, and that's why I was mentioning earlier on, I think in response to Melissa's question, the need for yeah. seeing the SDGs as a platform for learning and exchange, yeah. for thinking about investing in the processes of reporting, not just about tick boxing bits of data, but thinking about narratives of change that are happening so that people can learn from those. To think about um, exchanging between places and people to allow you know, the innovations in Bristol to happen in, in Brighton or Wolverhampton or somewhere else in the world. So I think that's what's, what's necessary um, and to encourage that in a dynamic way that allows that to to accelerate and embed in. But, you know, in the end, uh, political leadership, whether it's at the United Nations level or at national level, has to facilitate that and allow that to happen. It's happening clearly in Costa Rica, but it may, uh, needs to happen in other places, which, you know, is a political, requires mm -hmm. political change. Which is why I mentioned this question of the changing broader politics that we're confronting, because that is the context that we're up against. Yeah. You know, whether it's in the UK or whether it's in India or whether it's, you know, I don't have to list the countries, yeah. but we're up against a very different type of politics, a very different type of political leadership, which is not necessarily opening up the spaces for this sort of thing. So we have to create new politics, and that may be quite, in Chantal Mouffe's uh, terms, agonistic struggle. Um, that may be what we have to do. Sustainable development isn't just going to come from on high just because somebody up there thinks it's a good idea. Yeah. And that relates to this question of facilitating change. Um, what are these processes? I think they are long and deliberative and complicated and mm. negotiated and about agonistic struggle. Mm. They are inevitably. And I think there's sometimes a danger in the proclamations of it all must be done rapidly. We've got to rush. Mm. There, isn't, there are urgencies, but sometimes urgency can override careful, deliberative, long-term processes of building change. Mm. So it's, very, it's good that we have a sense of urgency because there clearly is a need for change. But urgency shouldn't mean rush. Urgency should mean patient, committed change. Uh, and sometimes that's going to take a while. Um, So here is a question about um, the, uh, the nature of, of, of struggles in different places. Yes, I think they are very different. Mm -hmm. Sustainability will look very different in Brighton versus rural northern Kenya. That's right. That's, sustainability has to be located around people's own struggles around environment and development. Mm -hmm. So we can't just impose a, a sort of northern version of environmentalism that was the problem of, uh, of environmentalism that emerged out of, in the 1970s. Um, environmentalism has to be grown from, uh, from, the, uh, from, from the locales and, and particularities. Mm -hmm. It would be called the environmentalism of the poor uh, in, various, in various contexts. Um, so it has, to, it has to grow out of people's real experiences. And sometimes that, you know, those real experiences are austerity and poverty and, and, and lack of power and agency, which are linked, of course, to environmental questions. Mm. So sustainability always has to be constructed in place by people. So the goals, the, you know, the, these big ambitious goals provide us a framework for that. And a lot of people complain, oh, well, the 17 goals, that's too many. I think that's fine. That's the point, is to have a complex deliberation about how they work. Um, we don't want just three goals to come from the UN and that's it. They have to be negotiated in place by people. Um, and that, as I said, will look, will look very different in very different places. But I think, you know, I ended my talk on a positive note. I mean, these are massive challenges. Um, and those of us who have 
debated these questions and thought about these issues over long periods of time, you know, there are moments when you can get a bit depressed, but there are also moments when there is hope and excitement and so on. That's why I showed those pictures from the level in Brighton. You know, here's young people, students out there saying, yeah, we've got to do something, we've got to do something now, and things can change. And they can change. We see change happening. And I think it's a political project, which is the broader project of development, uh, that has to galvanize that change and make it happen more broadly. And I think that's what, why we're in this business, yeah, I guess. Absolutely. Well, Ian, thank you so much. I mean, just by way of kind of almost a reflective remark about the long-term series, I think what Ian's given us is a fantastic exposition of why politics matter, but also a new kind of politics, which is built from people's real experience in all its diversity, in real lives and real real places. And I think that's always been at the heart of the way IDS as academics, but as gauge, engaging with practitioners all over the world, has thought about sustainable development over a long period. I think the ambition for the SDGs is for it to provide the kind of platform that galvanizes, catalyzes, and gives greater strength and courage, perhaps, mm. to, to those movements that we're seeing. And in my view, and I think it reflects in your talk, in a way the jury's still out. I think the SDGs could become that, yeah. or they could continue to be and become more this bureaucratic, frankly, anti-politics machine. Yeah. So, so let's hope. Let's hope that in a year's time, the next round of youth climate marches on the level will have some placards about the SDGs. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure about not that. Not sure but... about that. <laughs> or let's hope that at, at, at some level, they can, the SDGs can help to add up rather than repress this vibrant politics yeah. from below. So um, before we give Ian a great big clap, let me just thank all of you for fantastic questions, thank our online audience, and just put in a plug for next week's lecture, so same time, same place next Thursday, when we'll be hearing from Joseph Alcamo, who's director of the Sussex Sustainability Research Programme across campus, of which I IDS is a part, which has also, in some slightly different ways, been thinking about the synergies between the SDGs why we need to think about them as a, as a package. So um, please join me in thanking Ian for a really stimulating talk this evening.